All right. We are in the book of Galatians. So if you want to turn to Galatians for a time in Scripture this morning, uh, chapter 5 is where we're starting. Chapter 5, uh, verses 1 through 15 is where we'll be at today. Galatians have been uh, talking with people, just praying through it and uh, thinking of, of what's being communicated. And there, there's so much it really is. It's just like Paul on repeat. Uh, the, Jesus is the way to salvation. Jesus is the way to be justified. And uh, it's so, so repetitive, but it kind of gives us a different angle of that same reality time and time again. So uh, excited just to, to share today. My hope is that a uh, decent amount of content. So I'm hoping it's just clear for you all and, and heightening our under, understanding and appreciation of, of who God is and what he's done for us. Um, two quick reminders I have on here on my paper. Uh, there's a cookout May 21st, put it on your calendar right after church. And uh, if anybody wasn't here last weekend, didn't get the, the emails, uh, the parking lot expansion project passed. So we will be pursuing that more details to come. Uh, but just wanted people to know uh, two things you might've been curious about. Um, uh, so thinking about the text this week, I uh, was listening to a, a podcast of Google Talks. So these are, are talks that Google, uh, people Google brings in to talk to their, their leadership teams, people uh, that are employed by them. I don't listen to it for good wisdom and God-honoring advice necessarily, but uh, I am intrigued as to what... Uh, society and the secular world is feeding people, uh, especially those who have opportunity to influence our culture and shape our culture. And uh, Google is really a, a brain of America in many ways. I mean, the, the data that they have, the research that they can do, uh, the ways that they can influence what we see and uh, click on and chase after is um, maybe terrifying, but fascinating. And so they had somebody come in this week um, and she was talking about meditation and has studied meditation extensively, traveled the world, uh, spent a lot of time in India, um, was with Hinduism and, and the idea of meditation was talking about how meditation is so essential and really that uh, meditation is even more important than coffee. If you're a coffee drinker, you're like, what? That's crazy. You're like, coffee is what makes me effective, not meditation. She's claiming that meditation would actually make you more effective and efficient than coffee would because coffee really just lies to your brain and it tells you you're not tired when you're actually tired. Uh, so then it all kind of collapses at some point. But meditation allows you to get even deeper rest than like an hour nap would give you uh, if you're meditating correctly. But what most interested me about uh, this presentation on meditation and the importance importance of meditation was that she, she made this statement that was right along the lines of uh, when she's done meditating, she has this, this experience or this sense in her that everything's okay, that everything's going to be okay. It like puts her in this place of, of deeper peace and, and kind of rest. And it interested me because the way she was talking about meditation is very similar to the way I hear people talk about what the realities of God's promises do for them or the presence of God's spirit does for the Christian, that it, he gives us some sense of peace or assurance, like everything's going to be okay, right? At the, at the end of the day, if, if life's spiraling out of control, we cling to these promises of God and we rest and we say, it's all going to be okay, but she's making a very similar claim, right? They're, they're, we're both making a similar claim. And this, this is where the skeptic or the non-Christian person would step in and they would begin to say, you see, Christianity is really just another philosophy that allows a person to make sense of life. Like for her, meditation works. And that brings her peace and rest and assurance. And for the Christian, the stories of the Bible make sense. You orient your life around Christianity and it gives you purpose and peace. If that works for you, that's great. If meditation works for you, that's great, right? So very similar claims that stuck out to me uh, that, that uh, really it's a similar end that is desired, this place of peace. Some people would use different things, right? A different religion, a different uh, philosophy of, of thinking. Uh, some people might use drugs to uh, aid them. And she even mentioned that. She said, you know, my, my thought with drugs is so far as they work for you, go ahead and use them. Now, 
what she's getting at is really a, a reality that, that sweeps across all of society, that the end desire is most important, that the place of peace or rest or the sense of orderliness, she mentioned orderliness, she says, when I meditate, I feel like everything's put in order, in my mind, in my body, my environment. She wants order. And I would say all people everywhere, they have that desire in them. All of us want peace, right? Whether you're a Christian or an atheist or any other religion, you want to experience peace. And the world is saying, whatever it takes to get peace, you do that. And, and within Christianity, there's a big difference in, in that reality that we wouldn't say you can just do anything to establish peace. So we think of meditation or drugs or faith in Jesus or Hinduism, or maybe for you it's establishing wealth or your status, or maybe if you're stressed, you have a few beers because that makes you relaxed. It releases stress and brings peace. Or maybe it's fitness. You cope with, with stress in your life through fitness. People can get addicted to fitness. Or maybe it's food. You eat food to bring yourself this sense of relaxation or peace. Or maybe you binge watch movies because you have inner turmoil in your life and you want to get rid of it. Now, what are these? These are all means to an end. All people desire a sense or a feeling of peace. The question is, what do you use in your life to bring about a sense of peace or of inner orderliness, you might say? They're like gates that you walk through, right? We want orderliness. We want peace. What gates do you visit? What is it in your life when you feel stressed, when you feel overwhelmed, when you, when you recognize uh, the spiritual reality of oughtness? Something ought to be different, like Life has some problems. How do we cope with that is, is the question. What gate do you go to visit? Uh, and, and maybe you have a whole tool belt of options. Maybe for certain issues, it is working out. Maybe for other issues, it's finding the right friends or alcohol or gambling or drugs or coffee. It, it could be anything, right? The question I have this morning, and I think Paul is addressing is, does it matter? Does it matter which means by which you use to get to the end? Or is it really like we can just do what works for you? Because society would say, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what means you need to use to get there. You just go and find it. Because everybody has a right to happiness and fun and contentment. So whatever you need to do in your life, you go and get it. But no implies that the destination is most important. If you can use any means you want to to get there, what it's saying is you do whatever you need to do to get to that end because the end is most important. But if you say, yes, it does matter which means you use to get to that end, what are you saying? All of a sudden you're saying that the means by which you obtain the end is most important. And that's what Paul's getting at. All of us desire the same end, but you can't just get there any way you want to. You have to know the source. You have to know the essential means to obtain that with. So Paul, uh, this is his whole argument, uh, that the means are critically important, that it's vital, that specifically Jesus can't be removed from the equation. The end can't be had without using the right means. So today, we're going to look at a little more closer. I'm going to unpack all this. What is the end that we all desire? I'd say all people, not just Christians. What is that end? And two, why does the way people choose to get that matter? And uh, I think Paul, Paul's getting right at that issue time and time and time again. It's what we're called to represent in the world, to be advocating for, to be standing up to this reality that it does matter how people uh, pursue this, this place of, of greater peace. Okay, that's what we'll talk about uh, today, why that matters. Uh, so I, I want to pray for us before I read this, uh, set this time aside to the Lord. I'll read Galatians 5, 1 through 15. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we just come before you now, and uh, Lord, we, we do thank you for our church family, the opportunity to worship. Uh, 
Lord, as we look at Galatians chapter 5, we see Paul again uh, just petitioning to these people, uh, really crying out to them to recognize that, that Jesus is the only way to justification, that Jesus alone is the only way to the desired end. Uh, Lord, the, the temptations we face as human people uh, who, who are still uh, encounter sinful desires is that we would use a different means in the world to bring about a sense of peace or contentment or joy. Uh, so, Lord, I pray today that uh, any means by which we're, we're trying to satisfy ourselves or to cope with hardship or hurt, uh, any means that are outside of Christ, uh, that you would expose them, uh, that you would allow us to see their deceitfulness, uh, their inability uh, to satisfy uh, beyond this world. Uh, so, God, I pray that your son Jesus would be glorified and clearly seen uh, and that we may uh, turn ourselves over to him uh, more and more. We pray it in his name. Amen. All right, Galatians 5, 1 to 15. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view, and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? Right there, he's, he's saying, I don't preach circumcision. There were clearly accusations that he was still preaching circumcision. He's saying, no, I don't. Um, and, and I show that to you because I'm still being persecuted, okay? So if I still preach circumcision, which I don't, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettle you would emasculate themselves. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. All right, so as always in Galatians with Paul, a lot going on here. Uh, right away in verse 1, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it's a great verse. Underline it, circle it, uh, whatever you need to do in your Bible. Uh, for freedom, Christ has set us free. And that'd be the first question I'd ask, just this reflection. Your religious life, your pursuit of Christ, spiritual things in your life, does it bring with it a sense of freedom? Is, is there joy? Is there ability to kind of just rest? To sense that things are orderly, to sense that everything really is okay. Is it joyful or is it weighty and burdensome? And what Jesus is getting at here is when you're in the Spirit, He's worked in your life this understanding of what it is to pursue Him, it brings with it a sense of, of peace, a sense of freedom, that, that you're free to run led by the Spirit. Uh, and, and I think freedom is maybe the first word. We talked about this, this lady with meditation and all other people in the world desiring some end. Uh, what they want is freedom. That's one way we could describe it, right? They, they desire some sense of freedom in their life. Why, why does Google bring a huge company that's running uh, so much of our country? Why would they bring in somebody to speak to their staff about meditation, they bring people to speak about meditation and so many other things because they know all their employees have problems, just like everybody else. And they want their, their employees to be effective and to be efficient and to be creative and to really thrive. So they want to put something in front of them that allows them to deal with the problems that they have, right? Whether that's the stress they have from the workplace, the stress at home, maybe they got some other issues going on in their life, uh, all, thing, all sorts of things they could be working through, right? But they want 
all that to be gone. All of us would love to have no issues, right? No stress. We want this place of peace, which I think one way we can phrase it is freedom. We want an experience of freedom. Uh, so all of us want to recognize that, but you could think of all the issues today, uh, whether it has to do with racism, uh, whether it has to do with the expectant mother who wants to abort her child, or a person battling gender confusion, or a gay person, or a straight person, or a woke person, or an unwoke person, uh, every person here today, all of us desire inside of us this place of, of peace. Everybody wants that, right? Freedom is how it would be said here. But if we take an even closer look to some Christian terminology of what all of humanity longs for inside of them, we can see it here in verse 5. For through the Spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. Righteousness. Super important word. Super important concept. Revealed in Christianity, this idea that people would be in right relationship with others, and most importantly, in right relationship with God, that their actions would be right, that there'd be a deep sense of purity, of orderliness, of peace with all. The Bible calls it righteousness. And I would say from a Christian perspective, looking at our world, all people in the world are hungry for righteousness. From the very beginning with Adam and Eve, when the relationship was broken, they desired to have that relationship renewed. They recognize they've done something wrong. All of us do. We recognize there's something inside of us that's a little bit off and it needs to be restored. And the word that the Bible is putting on to that desire is righteousness. Everybody's seeking righteousness. It's like God has put it in our hearts, which the Bible says he has, right? He's put the desire for eternity in our hearts. It's an act of grace, that he would put this desire for righteousness in us so that we begin to seek after him. The book of Acts talks about that, that no matter where you're planted, uh, you might seek after the Lord and some may find him. You come into relationship with God. You find righteousness. That's what Paul's getting at here, uh, this idea of right relationships. And, and uh, the, the lady who talked about meditation, she talked about it very similarly that it brought her order and peace, but they're not the same. We're going to get there. So the first part of this, the end all desire for all people, I would say in biblical terms is largely described as righteousness. That's what we desire. You call it what you want. You call it peace. Our society today, without any thought of God, they'll just call it happiness or fun or contentment, right? And everybody has a right to that. You do whatever you need to do to obtain this, because you have a right to it. We're calling it righteousness. And secondly, I would say uh, any opportunity that a person has to really experience righteousness in the way that God defines it, any opportunity a person has to experience that in their life is grace. It's a total act of grace. Everybody wants it. Peace, orderliness, purity, no worries, but if anybody actually experiences that, it's grace. Now, why is it grace? It's grace because if we step back and evaluate our lives, I think all of us recognize that we have problems and that we've made mistakes. And when we have problems or make mistakes, they deserve a consequence. That's just logically fair, right? That, that it would be, there's, a, there's punishment, right? And wherever there's a need for consequence, there's no, there's no peace, Right? It brings fear. It brings uncertainty. It brings chaos and confusion. But we actually deserve some of that in our life because we've made mistakes. The only way that you could not deserve that is if you were perfect. If you were perfect and never sinned and never made any mistake, you would know what it is like to live in righteousness at all times. Our minds go to Jesus. But for us who are not perfect, any taste we get of righteousness has to be grace. So now we can say all these means that people are using to find peace would be a means of grace. Can we use any means of grace? What well, Paul is saying, no, we can't. There's only one true means of grace. But if you've found righteousness, you've really found grace. 
The means by which we find peace is a means of grace. So, we'd all think we want that, right? We want to experience that reality. And parents, you might think of your kids, or grandparents, you think of your grandchildren. If you ever gifted them an act of grace, where they've done something wrong, but you choose to not give a consequence. Or, or maybe you've even announced a consequence. This evening, you're not going to get any TV time. And they're like, oh, no. It's the end of the world. I can't watch movies. Right? That's our kids. At least like, it's terrifying. What am I going to do? Or you take the, take the Nintendo away for a weekend. Oh, no. This is terrible. But if you then step in, you've announced a consequence, which was probably fair because they did something wrong. Just like us in our life, we've done things wrong. We deserve a consequence. But if we step into our kids and then say, hey, you know what? I've been thinking about this. I know there's going to be a consequence, but I'm going to choose uh, to, to remove that consequence. I'm going to absorb that, essentially. And, and you're going to have freedom to do what your heart desires, to have that experience. You can still watch TV tonight. For them, that feels amazing. It's an expression of grace. You have become a means of grace. I would say you have become an image of what Christ has done for us, of pardoning consequence, Right? So we get to step into that, but it feels really good. So the question is, how do we experience it? Chapter 5, verse 1. How do we enter in to this place of peace, of righteousness? Chapter 5, verse 1. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Christ has set us free. He is the one who takes us freedom from needed consequence, right? Right? He frees us from that. Look at verse 4. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. They always travel together. Being severed from Christ is the same as falling away from grace because he is the only means of grace to give up what we want. So if you're cut off from Christ, you're now detached from grace. You don't get to experience righteousness if you're not attached to Christ, is what he's saying. Because we deserve consequence. So we're detached from Christ. We're removed from grace. And Paul is saying time and time again, Jesus is the only way to be justified. He alone can cause us to experience that reality. Now, can other means give us a taste of grace? Are there other things in the world we can do to experience God's grace? Absolutely. There's all sorts of things we can do to experience his grace. But there's only one thing we can do to be positioned into his grace. But once you're in that space, there's all kinds of things we do. But Jesus alone gives it. Nothing else can give it. So we like occasionally we'll take our kids to the zoo. Uh, kids love going to the zoo, right? You see all the different animals. Uh, you, you can even like feed the giraffes right now, which in some ways is kind of terrifying. These you know, kids, they're like eye to eye with a huge giraffe and they're feeding them lettuce. The, half the time these things, these tongues are like two feet long and they, they come out and grab the lettuce. And I know one of our kids like, that was scary. Uh, but they love seeing all the different animals. Uh, you know, I, I like the, I'm a, a big cat guy. So the, the cheetahs, uh, the leopards, those types of things. They love going to the zoo. But if we want to go to the zoo, there's a reality like I need something to get into the zoo. I can't just walk in and say, hey, uh, we're here to see the animals and, and march right in. They're like, no, you need a ticket. You need a ticket before you can enter into the zoo. I can get that ticket online. I can get that ticket at the booth. But I'm not getting in the zoo until I have a ticket. And what Paul is saying is Jesus is the ticket into this space of righteousness, into this space of peace. Now, once you're in the zoo, you can do all sorts of things to heighten your awareness and to better your experience of the zoo, right? You can ride the little trolley train and uh, pay, pay for $15 slushies and $20 French fries and all sorts of things. And it really like you maximize your experience at the zoo. You feed the giraffes, you go to the petting zoo, you do everything. And it deepens your experience of what it is to be in the zoo, There are all sorts of means of grace, 
once you're in his righteousness that you can participate in to deepen your experience of who God is and to be reminded of what Jesus has done. But Jesus is the only one who can get us in. He's the ticket. And once you have your ticket punched through Christ, everything else is yours to enjoy as you will. But you can't hardly do anything without attaching it to Christ. He's credited for your ability to even be in there. So we think of, uh, you know, everybody comes to this reality um, sooner or later that, that it has to be, in your Christian journey, it has to be put together with Christ. Um, I want to read real quickly from Paul Washer. Paul Washer wrote this book. I found it after, uh, so the title for the sermon of the day was uh, uh, Essential Means of Grace, I think. And after I'd written that, I saw Paul Washer wrote a book called The Essential Means of Grace. That's what it was, Essential Means of Grace. And in this book, he says, uh, the scriptures prove over and over that salvation is monergistic. That is the work of one. God is the author and agent of our salvation, and we are the objects of his saving work. However, with equal force, the scriptures also teach that our growth and sanctification is synergistic, that is, the collective work of two or more. What he's saying is the, the work of Jesus in, unto salvation is by one. That's what the Bible teaches from, from front to back is that you come into salvation by the work of one, monergistic. But once you're in salvation, once you're in the zoo or in righteousness, now it's synergistic and we have opportunity to participate in all sorts of means of grace that heighten our love for him, our knowledge of him, our experience for him. You can pray, you can read the Bible, you can fast, you can take communion, you can come to church, you can give money, you can serve the poor, uh, you, you can look at the stars, you can spend time in the outdoors. All of these things have potential now to heighten our awareness, but there's only one way in. There's only one way to get in, and that's what Paul is hitting time and time again here uh, in this text. How do we get in? Jesus. Uh, chapter 5, verse 5 through 6 through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. He's driving again and again the essential nature of Christ. In Christ, circumcision and uncircumcision count for nothing. Paul's not opposed to circumcision. Let's be clear about that. He, read, read the book of Acts and you can see he approves Timothy going and getting circumcised. He tells Timothy, if you need to get circumcised for the sake of ministry, go ahead. Right? He doesn't have a problem with circumcision. He has a problem with people saying circumcision is going to get you in the zoo. Circumcision is not going to get you into God's family. There's no doing that you can do to get you in. It's all through faith in Christ. The spirit working in faith expressed in love, that's what's going to get us in. That's the claim of the whole Bible, starting with Abraham. We go back to Genesis chapter 15. This is before Israel even exists. Genesis 15, 6, he believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He had a belief in God that triggered righteousness is yours. Relationship with God is yours because of belief. Here in Galatians chapter 3, verse 6, so then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. You get into righteousness through a faith that's attached to Christ. In Ephesians chapter 2, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. Faith in Christ is the ticket. It gets you in to experience it. So this much is sure in all of Scripture, the way into God's promise of righteousness is by faith in Jesus. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's what Jesus says. He's the gate. He's the gatekeeper right there through Christ. So we might imagine to, to carry the illustration of the zoo a little bit further. Imagine uh, there are some people, you want to get in the zoo, but you didn't have a ticket. So these people say, hey, uh, I, know, I know a back way in. We can climb the fence. Scripture actually talks about this, like people climbing the gate, climbing the fence to get in with God's sheep. 
And, and they're saying, hey, I got, I got another way in. And you try it, and you try it again, and it doesn't work. And they say, well, let's meet next weekend, and we'll try. And, and you keep getting caught. You keep getting kicked out, whatever. Like, it doesn't work. Or, or maybe somebody even comes up and they says, look, you can't get into that zoo, but I've actually created a zoo that's a mirror image. It's just like that one. So if you can't come to that zoo, why don't you come visit mine? And you can see the animals, and you can have an experience over here, and you'll have a great time. But there's a reality that this zoo is not the same as this one. It can't be. It's staffed by different people. Different people created it. Different ideas drove it. So you can go into this zoo that's being offered to you by some other people, but it's not this one. And that's what I'd say the lady with meditation, she can say that she's experiencing peace or some sense of everything's okay, but it's totally different than what the Christian experiences. And that's true for everything else too, right? And any other religious set could say the same thing. Well, her experience of peace through mindfulness is different than my experience of peace through Christ. Now, does it matter? Does it matter? Because it seems to work for both. It only matters if it's true that one of them's real and one of them's deceiving. Because if, if you are trying to get in to this place of peace or get into the zoo, or you're experiencing a, a reality that you think is actually peaceful, but in reality, it's nothing like it at all, what would we say? You've been horribly deceived. You've been lied to. You think you're experiencing peace. You think you're experiencing what that zoo's like. But in reality, once you get in there and you look around, you realize, oh my goodness, this is totally different. This is exactly what Paul gets at in this text. Uh, chapter 3, verse 10, he says, uh, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. You're cursed. And we talked about that extensively. You're cursed because you're chasing something that's a deceptive lie. That's not even true. And that's what he gets at uh, here a little bit later with uh, verse 7. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? So now it matters immensely if it's true. Paul is emphatically yelling to these people. Uh, he, he says, I wish I could be with you so I could change my tone. Because I'm so perplexed. Like he's literally, he's upset with them. He's confused. He's, he wants them to know you can only get in through Jesus. The desired end of righteousness is great, but you'll never get in without Christ. So knowing the means of grace is more important than the destination because there's only one. And if there's only one, it means that if you find the means of grace, you've found righteousness. This is why Christ is our righteousness. But society is feeding everybody a lie, including Google and any secular-minded people, that you can have peace in your life in a way that's totally detached from Christ. It's not true. You can't experience that without one who has been perfect and can gift that uh, through what he has done. But our world is saying, do whatever you need to do to all those people I just listed all across the spectrum, you just do what you need to do to experience a sense of peace. And the Bible's claim, God's claim, has designed through Christ is, it's a big fat lie. It's a totally different reality than this one. And we can be deceived for a while, but when the end of life comes, people recognize, oh wow, one is able to give in a way that even extends beyond life. But the rest is just in the flesh, and it has an expiration date that comes who knows when. But in Christ, this is a promise that is eternal and goes on and on. But the Lord is just offering uh, anything that you want. It's really all subjective, relativistic moralism that you just do whatever you want to make yourself feel good. And people have nothing to fight for. Um, I want to look at verses 7 through 9 quick. You are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You were running well. They had hold of Christ. They had hold of the singular means by which to obtain grace. They were with Jesus, but they stopped obeying truth. They're going back 
to the ways of the world, which it talked about in chapter 4, verse 8. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not God's. You're going back to being enslaved by people who think they know the way in, but they don't. You're living just like the world is, but now that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more? Once you have hold of Christ, you're in. And it can't be detached from that in any way. That's what Paul's getting at here time and time again. Um, So concluding this, the means by which we obtain righteousness, peace, joy, fulfillment, contentment, if we're trying to find that in our life in any way that's detached from Christ, it's a deceitful lie. It's not of God, and it's not glorifying to God. So anything that we do, when you're stressed this week, when you're confused this week, when you're feeling sick this week, when you got relational problems or financial problems or professional problems or the list goes on, you recognize there's something in you that's not right, whatever we go to has to be brought under the lordship of Christ. So if, if you need to meditate, I don't, there's nothing wrong with meditation in Christ, right? We, we pray. We're people who pray. If you, if you need to do fitness, you can do that under the lordship of Christ, that he's pleased with it, that, it's, that you're not replacing him. And, and, that, and that goes with all the, the coping mechanisms that people have. As a people of God, anything that we would call a coping mechanism or strategic way to to deal with things has to be done under the umbrella and the lordship of Christ. None of it displeasing to him. None of it out of line with what he does. And as we participate in that, it's showing us more of who he is. But he's the one that we hold on to, whether it's meditation or prayer or confession or communion it's got to be in Christ. You know, there could, be a, there could be an atheist in here today that takes communion. You think, it doesn't mean anything to them. There could be an atheist in here today who, who reads the Bible. It's just black words printed on a page. There could be an atheist today who sits here and bows their head while we pray. It doesn't mean anything. It's empty. It's just rote, like empty tradition, right? until it's under the lordship of Christ. And that's what Paul is saying. If the common denominator is always Christ, then stop saying something else can accomplish what he can do. Christ is the one that has to be attached to all of it, faith in him. He's the one who drives uh, everything that we do. And that's what Paul's getting at uh, time and time again. It has to be through Christ. So as we share uh, time in communion, one of the primary means of grace Uh, which is a means of grace for the people who are in Christ because you're taking it in faith of what Jesus has done for you. His death on the cross shapes our understanding of communion. Um, As we do that, I invite you to just be thinking about what other things are in your life that you might try and use to enhance a feeling of of peace or to enhance a a feeling of uh, everything's going to be okay. And And if there's anything that's not under the lordship of Christ, that you'd have an opportunity to lay it down and say, this is a deceitful lie. And as you let go of that, you might be scared because you've been trusting that, those faculties a long time, but you're going to let go of them. And where do you go? Go to Christ. Go to Jesus. And whatever's pleasing to him, we bring that with us. Um, So this morning we have opportunity to to lay those ways that uh, maybe we're going astray before him to bring our heart and our mind back to uh, the work of Jesus. Um, So for our time of communion, uh, I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'll invite the elders to come forward as I'm uh, reading this. Uh, Real quick housekeeping, if you're a guest or visitor today, uh, you put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
Um, if he is the one you go to for your fulfillment, your joy, your peace, uh, we invite you to participate with us this morning. Everybody will come down this middle aisle and then just kind of roll out to the sides. Uh, there are gluten-free elements. If you need gluten-free bread, just let us know. Uh, there are also cups of juice that you can take. You can drink a cup of juice or you're welcome to rip off the bread and dip it into the cup as well. Um, so that's the, the logistics for our service. And the text... 1 Corinthians 11, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink this bread and drink the cup, or eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. Um, so you see in there, this, this testimony is what we've been talking about, that what we do as a church, all of it points back to what Jesus has done for us. Uh, that he has given his life. It's a testimony, it's a proclamation of the Lord's death, uh, which is our avenue into righteousness. Um, anything we've been doing out of line with that uh, is what it talks about here of, of confessing that, uh, that we'd be guilty of trying to do what only the Lord can do. Uh, so I want to take a moment in prayer. Uh, I'll pray for us, invite all of you just to spend a little time with the Lord as well as you need to in, in just your, your personal life. I uh, ask him to, to set some things aside uh, to help you with that. And then uh, when we're done praying, the worship team will pray, play, and uh, we can come forward. Let's pray. Father God, uh, we just come before you now as we prepare our hearts for communion. And Lord, uh, so thankful that, that we are a people that uh, you've set apart in this world to be your representatives. Uh, to, to be able to do things that point to uh, the work that you've accomplished through your son Jesus on the cross and that uh, our ability um, to experience your righteousness comes only through his uh, finished work as a payment for the sin that, that keeps us from being able to experience your righteousness. God, that is uh, the dividing wall, our, our brokenness, our wrongdoing our lack of righteousness. It keeps us from entering into your kingdom, into your presence. Uh, but Jesus, by his grace and his obedience to you, uh, has paid for that sin. And uh, he's punched our ticket uh, if we have faith in him. So God, we, we thank you that you are the one who can forgive us. Uh, we, we pray that you would forgive us, Lord, for, for ways that maybe we've been trying to pacify ourselves uh, to bring about a distraction of stress or wrongdoing, uh, maybe people uh, struggling with guilt or uh, just processing stress in their life, uh, and they're, they're turning to things that are not you, Lord Jesus. Uh, Lord, if, if any of us be doing that, I pray that you would make it clear, and I pray you would lead us to set it aside, and I pray that you would send us running uh, to your feet at the cross and that all we do would be honoring to you and given to us uh, as a means of grace. And we're thankful uh, that we get to participate in all the means of grace in this world uh, to see who you are. So we give this time to you and ask you to use it in our church, in our lives as individuals. Uh, thank you, Jesus, uh, that you have saved us. Uh, we pray it in your name. Amen.